I'm not scared anymore of criticism. I'm not scared anymore of comments. And actually, even who critiques me a lot, I actually invite them for breakfast. One day I just woke up and I say, I'm going to keep my smile and prove you that I deserve that job. I deserve to be part of this world. Is there a feeling that the, the fear around having a negative review maybe comes more from the business side? I mean, if you never criticize anything, why would anybody read anything? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're honored to have you, Olivia Rustin, Creative Director of Belmont. Susie, we're so, so honored to have you. You are a journalist, a critic, a fashion expert, and a, most recently a podcast host. So we're absolutely thrilled to have you both here today. And the topic that we're going to be discussing is fashion criticism. Now, it's changed a lot, obviously, since the rise of social media. And I think certainly since the early days of your, your days at the Herald Tribune, and I just wanted to ask you both, you know, how you think it's changed? Where is that kind of center of gravity shifted to? Is it more consumer facing? Is it more consumer centric? And yeah, you know, what, what is the state of fashion criticism now? I think the great difference now um, in fashion critique is that there are so many people who think that they know what the result should be is whether something's a success or not. And I'm not saying that that is a criticism, but there's no doubt about it that in the past, we were considered as experts and we tried to be experts and learn about it. Um, now, everybody is an expert. And it makes it very complicated because it's this old line of, do you love it because it's good? Or is it good because you love it? And that's the big question, isn't it? Is it about you personally and how you respond to something that someone's designed? Or is it larger than that? Mm. Like within a bigger context? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Olivia? How do you sort of think about that? I mean, I always, we were obviously in Athens together. Yeah. And you talked about kind of your early career and how some critics understood it, some didn't. And it's sort of crazy to think what their objections were now when you framed it in Athens. I, was, I remember my mouth just opened and people were sort of criticizing you for things that they wouldn't criticize you for now. So do you feel that that's changed? Because I feel like you've always had a kind of keen eye on your consumer. How do you feel like it's changed for you and how you think about it? I think it's, I think, I think it's really interesting because now it's almost 12 years at Bauman and I can see that how the critics have changed. Um, I know Susie from long mm. and I always, um, always appreciate your critiques whenever it was good or, or, or bad, you know, I think mm. it's really important to keep, uh, honest because I mean, that's the evolution of a creative director listening to critiques. But I have to say that critiques of the beginning of my career were really different. Mm. I think the rise of social media kind of like changed a bit the critics of the of the journalist. There is really few there are few journalists today that have a strong point of view. Mm -hmm. A lot of advertisement as well, which means that sometimes the journalists are not fair with some brands because maybe there is not enough money to be fair. You know, like <laughs> yeah. so. Um, I mean, there is uh, there are a lot of change in twelve years. I can say that um, I agree with Susie. I think some. I don't really know sometimes some critics if they are really focused. I want to say that you might critique the work or you might critique the persona. You might not like the universe of the, of the creative director, so you might judge in a different way his work on stage and the one way. Um, you might not like his choice you know, of muses and you might question his vision and so you might at, at one point question his clothes. Um, I think I saw an interview actually at Show Studio with you talking about me and, and I love what you said at that time because there were a lot of people around and telling you um, that they didn't like my show and they didn't like the craft. Mm -hmm. And I remember you saying that you're not, you were not sure if we're criticizing me or if we're criticizing the commercial aspect. That was a real question and you were saying, my social media as well maybe is influencing the panel because I had a lot of followers, so people was not giving me maybe credit because I have many followers. So, you know, I think today there is a real question of, of professionalism in the journalism. Mm. Like the difference between the persona, the, the person behind the brand or yeah. that's fronting the brand, yeah. and the actual work itself. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point, actually. I mean, 
I think it's what I sort of see is like if we look at the way it's evolved. I mean, I think you know, Susie, you've seen you've been a very big part of that. You were saying that you feel like you've been with a lot of designers from the beginning. You've, she's known, I'm sure, you for a very long time. I've always read your your reviews as from the early days of my career. So you have a perspective that very few other critics probably have. And it's one of the reasons I'm so interested in your perspective and how things have changed. Because on one hand, you are very much the establishment. You've def almost defined what a, a critic is and what the, it should look like. And many critics today model themselves after you. I know I tried to. Um, but now you've also moved on to other things and you're a podcast host and you're very much almost, I don't know if I can call you a social media influencer, but you are out there in the field. You are very active on social media. Are there some positive sides to having that social media accessibility and having more people weighing in on the critique? Well, the thing I love most about having 700,000 um, <laughs> followers on Instagram is that they all seem to be tremendously young. I mean, almost everybody in the world is younger than me, but this is really exceptional. And um, it's fun. It's fun to think that a new generation, someone just stopped me today, and um, that a new generation knows me and has heard of me, and that's good. But there's something else I want to say, which is about criticism and learning things. You know, when we first met, uh, Olivier and I, it was after a period when the um, previous designer had sort of left in a rush mm -hmm. and um, one didn't want to ask exactly what was happening, but I could see that he was tremendously nervous, which anybody would be. And I said, just do your best, you'll do it great, it's fine. And I would truthfully say I have never missed a show right the way through. But of course, I learned so much. I had no idea when we first met of your history, of you not knowing who your um, parents were, of feeling that you needed to protect women for all sorts of personal reasons. And therefore, the way that I looked at your clothes w was much deeper, I felt. And I, it felt deeper as I learned more about you. And then, of course, you came and you made a film, and I mean, everybody now knows what the story is. But that is very difficult unless you are in at the beginning. If you just go in when somebody's famous, they've already decided what their story is. Mm -hmm. And you can't say, well, actually, what they're saying is wrong about themselves, and this is, I mean, ridiculous. You couldn't do such a thing. I think, above all, people should uh, give the reaction of themselves. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be for themselves. That's the big difference. If it's for yourself, it's about whether you like the colour or whether you like the length of the skirt or whatever. Um, if it's something that you feel something in your heart is moving because you see this because of the way it's cut around the woman's body or men's body indeed. And I think that's the thing. You've got to distance yourself from the personal. But at the same time, you have to accept that you're writing about somebody who is presenting clothes that you yourself might want to wear. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. Um, Olivia, again, going back to the our Athens trip, um, you, I was so struck by how you talked about you those early days at Belmont and, and what a huge challenge that must have been for you. And you talked about almost surrounding yourself with, um, I don't know network is the right word, but a family, let's say. I think that was the word you used, of people that you could turn to for advice, could get that kind of feedback, that have that understanding. I think every creative director, every designer, every artist probably needs that feedback. And you talked about how you created this kind of safe space for yourself. What was maybe a piece of advice that you were given in that, either in that group or maybe from Susie, that really was quite meaningful for you or that maybe changed your way of looking at things? To, to come back to the story, like Susie mentioned, I was the right hand of the creative director like 12 years ago. When he left um, and they proposed me, Bauman proposed me the job of creative direction, you know, I was 24. Mm. And all my team that I worked with, but I was not a creative director at that time, I was the head of the studio. When I told them I'm, I'm getting the job of creative director, they all looked at me and I could see in the room who would like to stay and who wants to leave. <laughs> but you know what, because if you think about it, 12 years ago, a creative director that's 24 of a French luxury house from 1945, it was, it was a huge question mark. Mm -hmm. So the first question mark was already internally in Barma, at Barma with all my teams. Mm -hmm. Half of the team was older than me. So getting the respect was really hard. Mm -hmm. And I had to prove that that was my goal, my, my passion. 
And, and so we build that team where the first word that I say is that I want all of you to be honest and transparent with me from the beginning till the end of my career. Because I think it's really easy to lose yourself when you get success. Yeah. It's really easy to, above all in fashion, when people are going to lo look, look at you and say, oh my God, I love you. And after they're going to write the worst, yeah. you know? So this is, this is the beauty of fashion. <laughs> fashion can be so cruel, but fashion can be so beautiful at the same time. And so um, I remember it was the first year I built that team. I mean, that team was there. We built the collection. And I remember my first show. I did my catwalk like with all my girls and, and the day after the critics came. And there I was just like, wow, that's tough. Because mm -hmm. no, one is, no, one is, no one is teaching you at school to be the, a, a creative director. Mm -hmm. They teach you to be a great designer, you know, the pattern makers, like the modelism, like everything. You, you, you can be a perfect student, but you can, when you face the critics, I think, and you were so young because I was 24, mm -hmm. it was really hard. And I remember some of them was just like, oh my God, this is not going to take long. Like this guy is not going to keep long his career. Like uh, it's a fireworks, you know, like mm -hmm. it's just like one, one shot and it's done. And I remember like, and I remember Susie at that point, you saw me really stressed and you, you came to backstage and I was like almost in tears. Uh, actually, it was the second show, and and you were like, "Why are you so nervous?" And I'm like, "Because I'm scared." And you looked at me and you say, "Don't be scared. Trust yourself, and and you're doing great." And I think when you get those words, I think Susie was seeing in me not only the creative director that I was, but as well a hope for future generation. Where many of the journalists didn't mention my skin tone. Mm -hmm. and didn't mention, you know, all my choices. They were just like, okay, your clothes are too sexy. It's just <laughs> sexy. And I was just like, in a moment where everybody's true is minimal, maybe Barman was maximal, it's true, mm -hmm. but that was my aesthetic. And I think the beauty of Paris when you create a fashion show is that you have different kind of aesthetics that is in the same city. And that's what I love. But to come back to that story, I was a creative director that was doing clothes and have an aesthetic that was really specific, flamboyance, craftsmanship from Paris and everything, when everybody was like obsessed with a t-shirt and a pair of denim. And at the same time, I had a, a storytelling that I was fighting for people to understand where I come from, not for victimizing me, but just mm -hmm. to explain that mm -hmm. I'm 24, I'm a black designer in Paris, I worked so hard to be where I am. I'm so young and I need help. Mm -mm. Don't kill me before helping me. Help me and after you kill me if you think I have no talent. <laughs> and and that's how has be, that has been my career from day one. And after we went through so many topics like from social media when I got killed from journalists because they were like, oh, social media are not luxury. And I remember- Are they that, still saying that? Not, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> I had, at the time, you know, I had a I had people in my management, so I'm talking about eight years, nine years ago, when I post my first selfie on Instagram, they were just like, this is not luxury. You cannot absolutely be on Instagram because mm -hmm. we love a creative director that is mysterious. I mean, what I was saying is that that was part of the 80s or the 90s. We are in 2020, you know, 20, mm -hmm. 2010. Like people need to, have a, to see a face to represent a story and storytelling. And I was saying, I'm sure that you were that kind of man at that time that said, oh, we cannot have e-commerce, you know, we cannot sell on internet because it's cheap, you know, and now you know that e-commerce is like one of your biggest retail. So, you know, like, it's just like pushing and fighting um, in many ways. I remember the critique you got around the Rihanna. That was, yeah. that was quite, now it's quite shocking. You mentioned, I think you actually listed some of the criticism. And if you hear it now in this context, it's like, wow. <laughs> It's very racial. It's obviously racial. It's obviously, it's crazy to think that people could have said that and felt, I don't know if you want to share it or if I, I can. I can share. Yeah. I mean, in 2014, that's what I wrote to Rihanna. I had a dream and I wanted to work with her on, I mean, she was my muse. She was inspiring me style-wise, like music-wise. I asked her to do my campaign. And you can't imagine the numbers of interviews that I've done where people were asking me if, hip hop is luxury. Mm -hmm. Like 
and if she's the right muse for Parisian house, you know? Like people were asking me that. And I can tell you few of those journalists that if you start to read what they wrote, they might not be really proud at that time to have wrote that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think, you know, you just fight. Above all, when you come from Paris, where it's such a conservative city, uh, where it's really, um, you know, your mood board is, uh, let's say, Serge Gainsbourg, Jane Birkin, uh, Brigitte Bardot, and, and, and that's it. And it's the 7th and the 16th, basically, arrondissement. And when you start to imagine that, to, to explain that Paris is beyond that, you start to get a lot of haters. And those haters are not on social media. Those haters are basically on your front row. And I have been killed for the music that I chose, for the casting that I had, for the music that I, that I, that I had. And I won't, I won't mention who, but really big people in the fashion industry mm. had to just sit right next to me and say, you are killing the fashion game, you're not doing great, and you are ruining the fashion industry with some choices. It's interesting. I mean... I think it's, do you think, because we started by talking about how, you know, Susie, you were saying that a real, a critic should not just be reflecting what they personally like, but something bigger than that, giving a kind of bigger context. And then I, I've, you strike me as being someone who takes your brand very personally. It's very close to your heart, but also it's a reflection of you. So there's this kind of, as you said, you developed your, your persona on Instagram before many, many designers did, before many houses did. You saw that in a way ahead of the curve. Is it, does it make it harder to take criticism when it's so personal, for example? It may be, I, I mean, I don't think it's ever easy for anyone to take criticism. I think Susie could tell us some stories about being moved yeah, to different roads. I mean, if you always say, darling, you were wonderful about every show, it absolutely doesn't mean anything. So I think that, of course, I don't think you should set out thinking, I'm really going to get this guy this time. Yeah. Um, but I'm working on a book at the moment, and um, what I want to say in the book is I was there. Because what people don't understand is that so many people, now even more so, but even at the beginning, they would go to the few big names and they didn't bother with the others. And I'm sorry to say this, but it's true that recently more and more magazines, because financially obviously mm. they're not able to pay for people to go to lots of places, that it's getting to the stage now when they're just not covering things as they should be done. And you know, and I'm smaller so, brands and, and up and coming brands. Yes, I so enjoyed going at the beginning. And I would truthfully say that most people I've seen at the beginning, not everybody, but I've tried. And um, that applied also to, you know, going to the Far East and looking at things. I know. I, when we worked together at Vogue, I always remember thinking her, your stamina just made me feel I pale in comparison. She was going everywhere. And I was like, Susie, how do you do that? But you're right. You're, you've, all, you've, also, you've also been a mentor as, as well. So I, I wonder, maybe that changes a critique if you're getting it from someone who has been there, to your point of your book. I don't I think of myself as a mentor. I feel I have the possibility, because my name is known and because I've got Instagram with this, you know, over half a million um, people, that I have an ability to push somebody forward and to, which is something that I do all the time. But I wouldn't say that I was, I mean, I can't, I'm not a designer. I can't tell people how to design or what colors to choose. I can only say that I don't think that worked and try and analyze why. But I mean, I'm much rather, in, part, in my character, I would rather say how much I loved a piece and why I liked it, how it related with something that I'd seen before from the same designer, so on and so forth. So you're not going in for the attack. I mean, do you feel like maybe coming back to that, do you feel like when it's, because I think criticism is important. I think our industry doesn't have a really vibrant tradition of criticism. I mean, I think it did in the days that you very much were leading in that space. But is it harder to take it if it's so personal to you? I guess I, I'm curious for... I think there are critiques and critiques. I love critiques. I read all my critiques. Hmm. Like, and since the beginning, from day one till now, I'm reading all the critiques that I had on my co collection. Hmm. Whatever fashion show is or a pre like I'm reading all the critiques. I mean, you know who are the great people to critique you, like you, Susie, where any time you, you did a criticism on my show, whenever it was good or bad, it was still for me great because it feels like always an honor and privilege to, to have your critiques. 
as you mentioned, I mean, someone that's come to your show and say every time it's wonderful, there is no point because you're not going to, you're going to, you're no, not going to You can't grow. trust. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. cannot trust. So me, I love when, and I have really few people that I, their critiques are so important to me because I know that it's, it's done in such a constructive way. Mm. And after, you know, you have those people that they don't like you from day one and they won't, and they would never, ever give you credit. And so at that point, at the same time that you don't care about someone that's going to tell you you're wonderful every time, you don't care about someone that say that you're disgusting every time, you know? <laughs> so, so um, That's a good point, actually. It kind of equalizes somehow. Tell us a story about a critique that maybe inspired a, a slightly overdramatic reaction. I'll tell you a story about Chanel. And I did a big criticism of Chanel. And um, the, I was working with the Herald Tribune, which of course part of the New York Times. And everybody went into overdrive of panic because I did a very, very heavily um, not very nice show. And the next day, everybody came in with shaking hands. Remember then, we didn't see the newspaper until oh, the next course, day. Of course. And Karl Lagerfeld had clearly decided what to do. And inside he put, but everybody loves Chanel. What did your and critique that, say? We have to hear your critique. Did you say something it was, critique? My critique was nothing grand. It was just the right, my writing and one little picture, which was the way you did things in newspapers uh, in those days. So you were critical of his bag and he was I, like, uh, uh I was critical of everything. I said it's the, I don't know what I said, the worst show he'd ever de done or some <laughs> such thing. And... Um, but he, I'm sure, took it seriously because, you know, he would Yeah, it's kind of a compliment, no? It's a bit but of a compliment. But at the same time, he was so willing to turn around and to turn it into something. I mean, this was a whole page of the Herald Tribune, and this was at the time when everybody was there in Paris mm -hmm. from around the world. And so this whole page, enormous page, for which they paid for, by the way, uh, a lot of money. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um, he said, everyone loves Chanel. And uh, I thought that was so much Carl and so smart and so different from the hysterical attitudes that you got from so many of the designers, or for, more likely from the people who run the company. Yeah, that's a good story. But, that's um, a fantastic story. But uh, he was always like that. And he never said to me, I disliked your review. Mm -hmm. There were times when he was obviously very annoyed by it, but he never actually said, ne never mm -hmm. angry in the way some other designers would call me in and shout at me. It's more of a joust than a, than a, than a yeah, critique. That's brilliant. I love that story. That's brilliant. And I never at all want to be hurtful to a designer. Mm. But there are certain times when you just know that they're off-beat, mm. off-piste. And um, yeah. the result is that the, the collection's just not right. Mm. I think things have got more complicated now because there are so few people um, doing a show with the name that started with it. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, what I mean is that sure. so many have taken over now, as indeed you have. Um, mm -hmm. And there was an original designer. And when it was somebody of 40 years ago, that's not much of a worry. But when it's somebody um, now and they're, because of the ages, they're obviously going to be some more who, when somebody has to take over and do something in the spirit of a previous designer, That's if really they do hard. too much, yeah. everybody moans and says, oh, it could just have been still alive, it's pointless. Mm -hmm. Or if it's wildly different, it's more criticism. So I think things are quite complex now. And certainly the whole attitude of people writing things has changed because everybody mm. now has the Instagram in front of them. Everybody can make an instant judgment and it, it's perfectly acceptable to do something that I would never do, which is to do, say something cruel. Mm. I mean, I would never say that um, something was um, unsuitable because the designer was fat or some of those right. stupid Personal things attack that people of, yeah. say I would never touch in a million years. But um, everything has changed because everybody is now a critic. Everybody has their own opinion. But the thing that I say again and again, that's exactly it. It's their own opinion. Mm -hmm. It's not an opinion that's brought together by how people saw it and what was chosen in the shape or in the fabric or any of these things or the making of it. And so it becomes not ludicrous, that's not the right word, but it's becomes difficult to understand what this judgment call really is and who it belongs to, who is reading it, who cares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I'm quite torn. On one hand, I love that there's so many voices out there because growing up at Vogue and, 
you know, not of the same caliber that you are. So I was told what to do, what to do, don't criticize this, don't da, da, da. People who are not affiliated or attached in that way can be open and be honest. In fact, we had a discussion last week with a lot of students and it was interesting to hear their perspective. They were like, you know, we don't really trust a lot of critics um, because we, we feel that they're like, if they don't like it, they won't say they don't like it. They'll say, wasn't it a lovely day? And they'll kind of deflect <laughs> <laughs> or they'll change the subject. So I thought it was really interesting. These were like first year students, you know, they already understood how to read through or, or see through, I should say, a critic that wasn't really being very straightforward. So on one level, I really love that they feel they can, and they're passionate, they care so much about the industry. And sometimes some critics, certainly not you, Susie, that's why you're here today, um, get a little disillusioned, get a bit bored, get a bit, you know, they're not engaging uh, in the same way that some of these younger people are. So I really love that there are these voices out there. I think they need to have context. I think they benefit from having context and really understanding the bigger picture. But actually, interesting, a lot of them were saying that they like, you know, there are a few critics that they like to follow. <clears throat> and then they love to read the comments section. I thought, oh, God forbid, I would never read the comments section. I'd be too terrified if I were a critic director. <laughs> I think that's an area that I, I, oh, <laughs> I don't think I would be, have the courage, the strong stomach to do it. So I think it's, it's, it has both. But yeah, I mean, and, and you, because you have such a strong, your brand has always been social media, like, well, at least for a very long time before anyone else or before a lot of brands were doing it. Focus on social media, so in touch with your consumer yeah. and really reflecting this back and forth. And in a way, I, I, I'm curious, like, does it make it easier sometimes if you know what your customer wants, which you clearly do? You could kind of say, okay, well, that's nice. You, you think that, but I know my customer. Yeah. So maybe it's easier to have. I mean, I think, I think what you just say is the reality of our world of journalism and comments. I mean, critics and comments. Um, you know, when, when my, my, my social media started to grow, I started to realize that there was this kind of like division between journalism and Instagram. Me, I always say one thing, and I know that a lot of creative directors hate when I say that. I say being a creative director is being a businessman or businesswoman, you know? Like for me, you cannot be a creative director if you don't think about your business and about your customer. Like to me, this is the main, main thing because you can be an artist, but you're not creating clothes in your bedroom. You're basically creating clothes for retails, wholesales for the world. So your business is important. And of course, when you, when you start to listen to the comments and, and your following, uh, you start to understand what they want as well. So you build the brand with people that follows you, but you don't forget the, the I would say the professional criticism. Mm -hmm. but because for me, one, one and the other can get together, you know, like mm -hmm. after you have those haters that I just love to hate and this is okay, you forget. But some comments are really, really constructive and, and I love reading them. Of course, there are tons of them, so I'm not reading all of them. Yeah, you're gonna get a lot more now than after this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do read them and but I do read my critiques and I don't think we should be scared, you know? This is what I learned with years and time. I'm not scared anymore of criticism. I'm not scared anymore of comments. And actually, even who critiques me a lot, I actually invite them for breakfast. Giving you an example, you know, there is this woman that I'm, I love, Vanessa Friedman. Mm -hmm. I don't think she really liked my shows. <laughs> And I don't think I ever really get great, great critics in, on New York Times, um, but I love her critics. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe that sometimes she, she, I feel like I, I grow when I read it. So once I, I, I remember I invited her to um, Hotel Coste in Paris, and she was surprised because, I mean, my critics always been bad, so I mean. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh gosh, what's <laughs> And I, I had a nice breakfast with her and I said, you know, Vanessa, I, I, I love what you do, I think you're, an iconic persona for me, like you're someone that inspired me. And I mean, I read your critics from day one when I was young and till today, but you never liked my shows. Mm. I never got a nice critique. And she said, you know, Olivier, it's not that I don't like your show, but you made it, you, you, how did she answer? She said, it's really easy for me to write about you because you made, you, you kind of make it easy for me. For some of those shows, I have nothing to say, but you at least, I have tons of pages to write. <laughs> and you know what? I, at the end, I left the breakfast say, thinking, you know, I would rather that someone write, even if it's bad, 
than actually ignoring. Ignorance for me is what scares me the most. Wherever, in fashion, in love, anything, like ignorance is what I'm, I mean, I'm scared of that. So, you know, at one point you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm in my 30s, I'm not anymore in my 20s, I still have my job, I'm still creating a world, I have people that believe in me. So I keep my smile, I don't punch back, I'm just happy where I am, and I will show you, keep showing you, showing you, showing you. I think when you're a creative director, you, you have the insatisfaction that is part of you because you cannot be satisfied. Because when you, you don't live in the present, you live basically always in the future. You create a collection for six months after. So basically, the present doesn't exist. You're always future, future, future. It's going to be cool, it's going to be modern, what people are going to think. So you, you, your insatisfaction become, becomes your adrenaline, you know? And I think one day I just woke up and I say, I'm going to keep my smile and prove you that I deserve that job. I deserve to be part of this world. And, and I work hard for that. Yeah, definitely. I think you've been so influential in, in the fashion industry. And just going back to what you, you were saying about those critiques around Rihanna specifically, because I just think that's insane now to hear that. You know, she was just with her pregnant belly, beautiful pregnant belly at the Vuitton show. And, and you just see how much the industry has changed. And I feel like you've been a part of that change. And, and also for you, I think, Susie, you've also had a huge influence on the way our industry thinks. And I think continue, you continue to have that. I just kind of want you to talk a little bit more about how and when you decided you were going to go on social, do all of this on social. I had already started um, doing things online because I was interested in it. And I've always been interested in anything that's new that can embrace the way you work. And so I was already, um, I won't say I'd got very far in it, but I had already started and I already knew what I was doing. And so I just flowed into it rather than sitting there and saying, well, what can I okay, do? I'm desperate and so yeah. on. And also, you know, I'm a very sort of busy person. I don't like sitting around lounging about doing nothing. I found the pandemic very, very hard because I mm. live on my own. Mm. I found it really, really difficult. And it, in a way, it was a little... The, how can I describe it? It was a little family. And these people that I wrote about, people that I knew or people whose things I saw and so on, and, and, and it grew in that way, like a family grows. Mm. And um, I was amazed, I must, I'm still amazed at how much it, it caught on. But it's because, you see, I did what I've always done, which is write about fashion and um, I didn't really change anything. Of course, I write in a different way. And of course, there has to be a visual side, and there I'm not so brilliant. Um, yes, but you are. I think you're pretty brilliant, <laughs> you actually. Are. You have um, such an amazing viewpoint because of your your time in the industry and and the amount of time you spend. In fact, I w I was reading recently that you you had your break. I think it was Anna Winter's father. I think was one of your the people the, that you started your career with. Anna Am I Winter, correct? Anna Winter's father. Mm -hmm. um, found me. I was at, um, I was a tiny j journalist and he found me and he made me the um, writer for the Evening Standard. So and that cool. was when I met Anna. I was invited for her 21st birthday party by her father. Wow. And she was too shy to dance. But I danced all the time and had a great time. That's a really oh, wow. story. <laughs> I know when I read it, I was like, whoa, that's interesting. Yes, that's remarkable. So you, you have this perspective of the industry that not very many people have. And I think you're right. It's funny that you said you don't feel that you've changed what you do. You've just changed the platform. And not everyone can do that in a way that's, I'm very, I'm, I always look at what you're doing and where you and Natasha are going and mm -hmm. <laughs> following you. So it's brilliant that you're kind of, you've just seamlessly become sort of social media savvy. And I imagine that having this presence on social media has given your work and you as a person much more visibility for a, a much younger audience. It, people stop me in the street. Um, Do they? <laughs> which, is, which is fun. And, um, yeah. you know, I always talk to them because I think it's rude not to. Mm. Um, but um, then I have, you know, 
I have all sorts of people and I like that. And of course I have Natasha, remember, those who don't know who Natasha is, she's really the person who does everything. I know I, who I'm Natasha just a, is, where is she? I'm yeah. just an addition to it all. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> she's an important, definitely important person. Oh, much mix. more than important. She is, has brilliant ideas. She, we work together and it's, we have fun together. That's mm. the main thing. And um, that's what I really think. I know I sound very frivolous because basically I am quite frivolous. And I just want fashion to be fun and enjoyable. And, you know, I'm very sorry for people who lose money on it. And, mm. you know, but life is tough. And those who do succeed, and I have somebody beside me here who succeeded, and he so deserves the success. Yeah, Working so hard, enjoying doing it. And, you know, I, I'm, it's only a joy for me to see people moving forward mm -hmm. in our industry. And yeah. um, for all that we mostly hear about the bad ones, there are so many people who have been successful, jolly good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's true, our industry has changed a lot, I think, even before COVID. But it feels like a lot of the changes that were sort of maybe already in the, in the mix before COVID just accelerated. You talked about the family that you kind of created your, for yourself, and that made you feel like you were connected to people during COVID. I think, I mean, again, I think that's when all the brands, if they hadn't already gotten on social media, they were like, okay, <laughs> we have to do it now. But I, I loved you said, um, you know, if you're not a social media person, don't try. <laughs> don't just don't try. I, I'm not sure. Oh, no, if I, I am. completely disagree on that. Do you disagree? Let's hear well, it. Let's debate. A, if you're not a social person, then you know, plunge in mm -hmm. and try and understand what it's about. And you know, it might not work for you. You might want to do something else. But um, I wouldn't tell anyone not to go for it because well, you know, I think the no, context. To be what fair, I was yes, you don't. What I was saying is that don't force yourself to be on okay. social like media. Like you don't have to. Basically. You don't have to. Yeah. Because I know that today this is a really great platform for communication, but I think some. Great designers are doing great without being yeah. on this platform, you know. Yeah, it depends. So that's what I'm saying. I think it's even worse when you try hard and you force yourself and it looks so fake. So, <laughs> I mean, and you can see some of them. So, I mean, you know, like I think it's always good to stick to yourself and don't try to be someone else. Don't try to. That was the kind of the gist of it is not to pretend to be a social media expert. It's, yeah. it's just because your, your marketing person has told you to do that. I think that was the, the crux of it. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I mean, thinking ahead to, next season and, and kind of this is all I mean I know this sort of never ending the seasons yeah do you, do you feel like our, our industries learn some lessons from COVID do you feel like do you feel like things have slowed down or do you feel like it's gotten faster for you as a designer I mean to me I don't feel like yes the fashion system has changed after COVID at all mm. I remember all those talks that we had during yeah. you know Zoom panels and we were all like okay this this fashion industry is going to slow down and Absolutely not. It got faster. I mean, it went faster and faster and more shows and more collection. Absolutely. And look what's happened now that all the biggies are, oh, the hiring, are hiring airports, not airports, but they would do oh, that the if they thought it was yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Um, but they, <laughs> they, take a, for you. they take a plane and then they put, you know, 70% of or large number of people who write about fashion mm. and they take them to somewhere miles away and um, put them in the grand hotel and mm. invite them to dinner and it only lasts about 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, but, you know, what, what do you do if somebody pays for everything that you do and so on? How can you take yourself seriously as a, a judgmental person? I should I say mean, here, in case the, the people watching this don't know this, but you don't accept gifts from brands? I do accept some things. I, okay. I don't think that you should, anybody should ever say that they never accept anything. Um, I stand corrected. And I'm, I'm very happy if somebody very nice and charming and young and <laughs> intelligent invites me out to lunch. That, okay. That's a hint. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think in general, you can't be serious yeah. if you accept nothing but what is offered to you. And this latest thing of the um, private plane and taking people around the world, I mean, I haven't the energy anymore. But also, I mean, I just don't get it, how you could possibly do anything other than say it was a great show. Mm. You can't and, really be objective in that situation. Well, that comes back to our topic of criticism. Like, it seems almost that the biggest problem around criticism is not the creative director. I think creative directors, creatives in general, do want that feedback. They want to grow as a creative but it's often really at the C-suite level or even higher up, um, where sometimes that it feels like it can be a problem, where they maybe just can't they can't tolerate very much criticism, or they feel that that's going to be have an impact on business, a negative review. Does that make sense? So, like, is there a feeling that the the fear around having a negative review maybe comes more from the business side? 
I mean, because you're talking about this desire to almost pay for this perfect review, perfect critique of the show. I, I can't make any judgment on this. I think everyone has to be themselves. Mm. And um, I don't think, I mean, I've had people give me breakfast, lunch, dinner and tea. Mm. And um, I can't say it made much difference to what I thought. There mm. are times when I'm much more gentle. If I know that somebody has perhaps a partner who is unwell mm. or if they've just lost their mother or something personal, if I know that, I would, and I see the show as being somewhat lacking, mm -hmm. I would never ever plunge in there and be mean mm -hmm. because I think that really you can't behave like that. I think it'd be really terrible. But on the other hand, I mean, if you never criticize anything, why would anybody read anything? Right, right. <laughs> like, do you think that our, the fashion industry has a, a vibrant criticism? I feel like the, the culture of criticism is very different and like, you know, in opera, in restaurants, my God, restaurant critics can be fierce. Uh, Almost any art, you know, fine art. I feel like there's so much of a, more of a tradition of criticism. I don't know why it's different in fashion. Again, I think your critiques and some of the newspapers are often more critical, can be more critical, certainly than some of the magazines. But what do you think we're missing by not having as vibrant, let's say, uh, a critical tradition as food, um, maybe fine art, opera, uh, or maybe you don't think, maybe you think it's just fine. I'd be curious, what do you think we're missing by not having a more vibrant culture of criticism? I don't know, it's complicated because basically there's so much advertising mm -hmm. um, from the side of fashion, shoes, all these things. I mean, they, they live and grow um, by being photographed and used and so on and so forth. And it's very, very difficult in those circumstances for the people who are doing the magazine or whatever it is um, to be really mean and difficult. I don't feel that I have any reason to reject myself as some wonderful person who never mm. criticizes anything and never has a free glass of champagne. I, I don't feel that that is my role mm. to start talking about that. Mm. But I think I've tried over many years, it's nearly, um, it's nearly 50 years now, I, I've tried to be honest in what I see. I haven't always succeeded, um, but it's the must. It's the best I can do. Mm. That's lovely. Well, Olivia, what do you think? Do you feel like there's enough criticism or the right kind? Or what would you like to see more of? I agree with you. I think the criticism needs to be more authentic and more spontaneous and less sometimes controlled by advertisers and big groups. I mean, let's be honest, because this is what's going on right now. Yeah. After, you know what, I think it's interesting there is a lack of great journalism and criticism as well, because I think when I started Bama, I realized that the criticism sometimes were always the same for all the same designers. And, and you know, at one point, if you are not this designer, you would not get a great critique. You know, we knew that there was like those few that, you know, are, that they call intellectual, conceptual. And so if you were not part of that crew, you would never be anyone else, you know, any, you, someone, someone else, you know, so you, you cannot be someone there. And that was for me really hard after, you know, I realized that at the time when there was a, a criticism that was really bad, people were scared of the business because it was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, if she wrote that means that we're not going to sell. And I think the problem that happened through the years and at least through this decade is that the journalism start to be so far from the business and from the clients and from the consumers. Mm -hmm. And the president start to be less worried of the criticism because they realize that they have not anymore an impact on business. Where years ago, decades ago, when you get a bad review, you could have a bad business. Mm -hmm. Now you can have a really bad review and have the best consumers that love your show. Yeah. For me, I have seen that because I start to have at the beginning, I didn't have really great reviews, to be honest. <laughs> and I was seeing my business. That's easy. <laughs> bad reviews, great business, you know, and bad reviews and great business. And so at one point, I think it was a mix because me, the critics that I had, I was listening, reading and understanding to be a better designer tomorrow. At the same time, seeing my business growing, I knew that I was doing something right. So to me, there was nothing to avoid from the other side. Or it was just like, Keep, keep working, keep walking, keep growing. And you know what I realized that today, it's true that criticism have less impact on the business, much less. 
but you read the criticism more as a vision for your brand and for how you want to grow more than being scared for the business. Because usually the best reviews are not on the most bestseller show. And this I learned from a fact, because when I got the best reviews, sometimes it was not my collection that sold the most. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference between, and this is what is interesting in journalism, is sometimes they're going to love a show where your president is going to knock the door and say there is nothing commercial, don't do that anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there is where the, the difference between journalism at the time is different today. And there's another thing that I think is important. It's, again, what we say, the social media. Because today you get a girl that has, I don't say, I don't know, like a model that's going to get 200 millions of followers and, having, and being part of your show you care sometimes more about the visibility of that girl in your show than the criticism of a, of a journalist. And this is what I think now is a bit dangerous mm. to go against what I am, which is a social media person. I think we need to come back to, to a honest and professional journalism, great critics, strong critics, mm. because we cannot go too extreme and not caring about talent that's going to judge us you know it's really important to grow you cannot just go in extreme and say i don't care about the criticism i just want to have my comments and my social media mm -hmm. this is going to be so wrong because there there's such a huge freedom of people that have no clue on what they say and what they write that that can be a danger mm -hmm. and i think the freedom of social media to me today and all those journalists that feels journalists when they are not and have the freedom to speak can be so hurtful with not at all a constructive point of view. And that's why I keep reading your reviews, Susie, because again, what I'm saying that is that I never all, I didn't get always great reviews, but anytime those reviews were on point and made me grow. When sometimes those new journalists that feels like they own the world because of maybe their social media or whatever, they can be really hurtful, they can be really cruel, and they can be really dangerous for the fashion industry. So I think we need to come back to really strong professionalism. Mm. No, it's interesting because it's interesting hearing that from you because, yeah, you have such a strong presence on social media, but I, I think, and, you know, Beyonce is wearing your clothes and you know, on tour and you have, you have that already. You have, you've already, you've kind of almost, you are still doing that. I was going to say you've done that, but you're still doing that in ways that brands could only wish, <laughs> brands only could wish that they could do. Um, but it's interesting to hear you say that you feel like there is a need for that balance between you know, that social media presence, the influencers, the celebrity, and the criticism, the context, the history. The, I feel too that some of my favorite critics, and some of them are not, um, they're young, they're, they're starting out, they know so much. Um, but they're the ones that do contextualize, they do kind of temper themselves a little bit, because otherwise you said, but they have such enthusiasm and such I don't want to discourage that generation, but I think you're right. I think having a bit of a context, a bit of a viewpoint, you wrote some reviews that were hard for some designers and, you know, and you suffered some consequences, some moving back or, you know, sometimes some creative, creative directors, they'll remain nameless, but will ban someone from the show if they, if they don't like the review. I, I think that I mean, I have to say about that, that the International yeah. Herald Tribune now just called the New York Times, yeah. um, really exceptional. And they never um, went into hysteria, at least not the people I was working with. Um, and they thought that if I did a bad review, then so be it. And uh, I think you have to say that it's very difficult to find, and it's certainly still true, of the um, newspaper. Mm. But it's hard for people and it's hard for some people to keep going when there are major criticisms. So I think one should be gentle, really, with thinking that they make no effort. Yeah, no, you're right. I'm sh I, I remember being in that position myself. <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> and one thing that I remember, I'm not going to say the name of this person, but it's a very funny story, okay. which is he said, you know, it's so terrible now. Before I even see your review, I um, I book myself in, and he apparently had somebody he talked to, you know, when everything... Oh, like a therapist was, or something. therapist. Yeah. So, um, wow. so he, he booked it in advance. <laughs> so it's like on my to-do list. Yes. And I said, can't you find a better way of spending oh. your money? <laughs> and he took it very, very badly. And, oh, no. um You'll be, maybe you'll be surprised if you knew who it was, I but I'm not to going know. to tell you. I would love oh. to. We're going to have to get her drunk and get out of her. I'm really, I am, I mean, I remember that, you know, I don't even remember that 
the designer who did this, I think I have a guess of who it could be, but Kathy Horn got really um, attacked quite personally on her personal style. And I always think, oh, it's like anytime it gets personal like that, either direction, whether it's a criticism of a, of a, a critic or a criticism of a designer, I always feel kind of like, oh, because as you pointed out in the beginning of our conversation, there is a difference between the person and the persona that you're presenting and the work. And I think th there should be some understanding of how they're different. It gets a little harder. I mean, you've been so vulnerable with your audience. I mean, I saw your film. I was literally crying from the beginning to the end. I don't think I stopped. It just was very moving, um, your film about your personal story. And on some level, I imagine that must make you feel incredibly, even closer to your audience or, or maybe not. I don't, I, I mean, you're you objective closer. in doing it. You feel yeah. closer. You know, and what Susie mentioned was important. And what I have, what hurt me the most in the criticism of journalists in fashion is that they didn't see more than the clothes. And I think, you know, when you talk about fashion, fashion is not only the fabric that you have on, on the girls or on the boys, and it's not only about the shape, it's about a universe that you build. Mm -hmm. And as Susie mentioned, I think when you look at the, my collection, you understand why they are like this when you know where, where I come from. Some people will see sexy party dress, some people will see armor, flamboyant armor, you know. Um, some people will see the bling and some people will just see that I, 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 um, I fight so hard to be, to be seen as a French person, you know, because a French citizen, because I had, I had so much racism at, when I was younger. I dream of castle, I dream of flamboyance mm -hmm. that I didn't have when I was a kid, you know? So I think you can see so many things. Uh, and still you might like or not, but you cannot judge someone without the storytelling. <laughs> you have a date? Yes, she's got a hot date. That's what, that's what it is. Is it your sister? Answer, you can answer. This is very relaxed. No, but what I was telling you is that I think the storytelling is important for every designer. As you see today, like I think it's so important to know where people come from and, you know, not be ashamed to say. Because mm -hmm. me, I remember when I started, you know, I think it felt like you all, you didn't know there was a mysterious thing about the designer and you would never mention if you come from a poor background, a humble background, whatever. You know, that was this kind of mysterious fashion system where you're just like, everybody is yeah. so the, amazing the and fab. And you know? the, yeah. And you know, when I did, my documentary on Netflix called Wonder Boy and I cried and I, I was looking for my biological parents, my mother, and I discovered that she was so young and she was from Somalia and my dad from Ethiopia. Mm. It was hard, but I remember that I was, I was happy because I can imagine the next generation having hope, mm. you know, and believe that they can be part of the fashion world and their skin tone will not define where they go, mm. you know, what they yeah. can do and what they cannot do. Yeah. And, and me, what I suffer as well in fashion about criticism as well is that no one wanted to mention that I was black 10 years, 12 years ago. Mm. I mean... Is that what you said when you accepted your award? Congratulations, by the way, in New York. Thank you. Michelle Obama, Dame Anna Wintour celebrated you at the Parsons Benefit. I thought that was such a powerful moment when you said that you were accepting this as a proud African man. Like, yeah. It really felt like, whoa, felt like that moment with you. I wasn't there, but I felt like yeah. it was. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's hard because there were some topics that fashion didn't want to mention because once you start to talk about it, mm. there is, you start to question a lot the fashion system and the fashion industry. And I know that few people have supported, like from Susie, that she's here today, but I mean, she supported me and knowing that I, we were building more than fashion shows, we are building a new world. Yeah. And so this is to me like a moment in my life that I would always remember. And, and you know, I realized that it's important to share with people more and not just doing a facade because, you know, there's so many designers that gone burn out, you know, like just like mm -hmm. going, going through a lot. And, and the problem is that because they are not, they don't feel like they could be honest with the, with their audience. So mm -hmm. they just put a facade, they smile mm -hmm. and after they go back home and they might be sad and they might be like, just like going crazy, you know? Yeah. And I think the fact that at one point when you start to be honest with people and say, I'm not good, I'm crying now. I, you know, I had an accident two years ago. I was completely burned. Mm -hmm. I mentioned to people, I was like, for, a year I was hiding myself, but it was through COVID, so it was fine. But 
I wanted to tell to people, I'm going through that, I'm going through that, or oh, I'm happy here. Just sharing with people is so important because that's, that's how you don't lose, you keep your feet on the ground and you don't lose yourself. That's a really interesting point. I mean, I, I think from a perspective of someone who looks, looks and looked critically at shows, I feel like sometimes critics, when they're just focusing on the clothes, it's almost a thinking, I can speak for myself, it's almost a, uh, it's not, it's almost the idea that that's more kind because you're, it's not focusing on the person and making a critique either way on the person. But I think thinking ahead and taking on some of what you both said, what advice would you, or what would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? Or what advice would you give for the next generation of critics? I mean, we can sort of finish with that. You want to start, Olivier? <laughs> I, st I still think we miss critics that are really professional today. We need to have more. Go back a bit in time and, and having more of people like Susie. That's for me, that's what we miss in the fashion industry. You were mentioning vibrant critics. I think that's what we miss as well. Less advertising critics, people that are more honest. No matter where you are, no matter what is the group that you work for, the billions that you do a year, I think critics need to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And above all, I'm talking to the president now, whoever president is going to watch us, but they need to understand critics is not make your brand going down, you know? Like at the end of the day, there is not a huge impact on business today. Maybe even good. Maybe a... Exactly, you know, but what I'm saying is that even when, because I mean, everybody loves to have good critiques, obviously, but even bad critiques help, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think this is what I, what I would suggest, more transparency, more, more honesty, more professional critiques, and, and a bit more self-confidence, mm -hmm. and maybe less critics influencer. I love that, okay. I, I think that fashion critics, if that's how you want to describe them, should be people who are interested in fashion and will go the extra mile, many miles, to go and see things, to look at the new and young designers. Always to be not chasing, but following the news that somebody is showing something and going. You can't sit at home and say, you know, this looks interesting. You've got to be there. You've and got to be in it. I think it's so important to follow the new and the young, but not to believe in them so much that you miss out with others. Mm -hmm. You know, the hardest time for designers is after they've been there about mm -hmm. eight, nine, ten years, and they're no longer the bright new things. And <laughs> financially, it's tough. And that's, those people need a lot of help as well. So I don't think anybody should be just chosen and the others ignored. And I would say that British fashion is rather too inclined to look at all the new designers coming along, many of whom are wonderful, and I'm totally in favour. But then they don't do much to follow up what is happening to those designers. Yeah, Christopher Kane just announced his bankruptcy, yes. for example, which is terrible. Such yes, a I mean, that's a good example. Yeah. And um, I didn't see any articles saying that he was in difficulties and so mm. on. It just We just heard about it. Yeah. And with so many things, I think that you can't give, as a journalist, the greatest gift you can give is to be there, to write the review, to talk to the designer, because, you know, you can't do a criticism unless you were there, unless you saw the shows, unless you wondered why the particular um, people were being shown. All these things, you've got to be there. You've got to be in it to win it as a journalist. 